of growing up in the Lutheran church like I did is not always a good thing. Because there was this constant battle between the culture that said, this is the Christmas season, and then we go to church, and the pastor being, you know, good Scandinavian, pious and all, would say, no, it's not Christmas, it's Advent. But, you know, a little part of me, throughout the 47 years I've been alive, has always looked at this as being the Christmas season. And it is. So today we're going to light this first candle here as a reminder that we walk these days in the expectation of something great. I want to say thank you to everybody that took time yesterday to come and and make the place look festive. I mean, it's nice to come and be reminded that we can expect great things. And you hear in our, our, our gospel today that we are supposed to do something. Did you hear that? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be ready. We're supposed to be ready to welcome the coming of, of the king. And I wonder, through, and it's, it's been done in my life, and I've done it too, but as I was doing a little reading and some research on this, I think that modern-day Christians, we read this wrong. We read that, you know, where it says two will be uh, in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding. One will be taken, one will be left. We always think that the, 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 the good role is the one what? That's taken, right? Is that how you've read it too? I've heard pastors preach on this for years. One will be taken, one will be left. But if, you know, what I'm reading is, historically, we've got it backwards. Back in the day when this was written, when Matthew put this together, the thinking, the mindset was that when you were out in the field, you were out in a place where you're not protected. And this was a fairly lawless time. And so if you were going to be set upon by a, 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 a band of, of, of robbers or a, a gang of people intent on doing you harm, one was going to be taken and one was going to be left. The one that was taken was going to be either carried off into another land or another place to be a slave to the one that took them. Or perhaps they would fall as a casualty, wounded or dead. But clearly in the, in the mindset of the writer here, the better place to be is the one that's left. Now why would that be? Because the one that's left is left to continue waiting. That sounds strange to me. Because the other thing that our modern culture has forgotten how to do is to wait. Waiting and hope, to me, are are synonymous with each other. You can't wait without being hopeful. If you wait in despair, man, that's an awful place to be. But if you're waiting in hope, you're like the kids that get ready for Christmas. You know, Christmas is coming. But I think we're forgetting how to do this. Because our culture is is getting so good at, at returning things instantaneously, and that's not always a bad thing. But what it does is it teaches us to expect now, and it it the byproduct of that is that we forget what it is to sit and to wait. I had an experience recently. I I have a great blessing in my life. It's called a man cave. Every man needs a man cave. Mine happens to be out in the garage. And it's the one place where I can go and not have to worry about stuff being out of place or, you know, as less as my son, you know, son goes out there, his sons do what they do and he's doing to me what I did to my father. But um, the man cave is kind of a sacrosanct place where I can just go. And when the house was built, the builder put in a, a, a gas line and electricity so that uh, the homeowner, which would be me, could hang one of those nice garage heaters up there, you know. They're pretty pricey. I don't have one of those just yet. Someday, but, but not yet. But I have something, the next best thing. I've got a little heater that sits on the floor, and that thing's a blast furnace. I hook it up to a bottle, and um, it can be 20 below outside. And I can go out in the man cave to work, and it'd be 50 degrees. Which, if you ever worked, you know, you're, you go out and you work with tools. That's like the perfect temperature. Not too cold, not too hot. So the weather's getting cold. I go out into the man cave. I'm going to fire up this little blast furnace for the first time in the year, and it wouldn't go. And I realized, looking at it, that the thermostat burned up. So I went to the store, and I'm looking for thermostats. And there's not a thermostat to be had anywhere for this model. It's like they don't even make this model. 
So I do the next best thing. I get the computer out and I go online and I start looking. And sure enough, in about three minutes, I find a, a, a place that's willing to, to sell me this thermostat that'll fit right in this heater I've got. It's down in Tennessee. So my next thought is, well, if I order it, it's going to be 10 days to two weeks before it gets up here. But what choice have I got? So I ordered it. One morning I was online. I, I ordered it about 7 o'clock in the morning. And wouldn't you know it, about 10 o'clock that day, I got a little thing in my email box. Again, instant gratification, huh? That says that my order has been received and is being processed. I thought, well, that's cool. That just means they're going to debit my bank account, credit my, take it out of my bank account. Well, no. By 1 o'clock that day, there was another email in my inbox saying that this order had been processed and had left the manufacturer and been picked up by the shipping company and it was assigned a tracking number. So I went online and I checked the tracking number and I watched. Four hours later, it was in the shipping hub and it was in transit already in the air from Tennessee up to Minneapolis. By 10 o'clock that night, I checked one more time, and it had been received in Minneapolis, and it had been processed in the shipping hub, and it was in Minneapolis from Tennessee, just from 7 o'clock that morning. So I thought, that's cool. Maybe it won't be 10 days. Maybe it'll be more like two days, maybe three days. So I went to bed. I get up the next morning, and I get online, and I check, and sure enough, at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, this thing had been scanned in, by 4 o'clock, it was loaded on a truck. And by 5, it was sent out to delivery. And sometime between 11 and 2 that day on my doorstep was a little package having my little, my little thermostat. You see, that's so cool. But you have to understand that when you get service like that across thousands of miles, what's the reason, what's the incentive to sit and to hope and to wait? There isn't any. But the gospel says that this is our job. You have to understand the nature of God. He's come and he's chosen us to be his people. And as his, as his people, we are now his beloved. We're his children. And as children, God's fondest desire is that we would choose him in return to be our God, to be our number one, to be our heavenly Father. Not just a, a righteous, judgmental God, but a loving, merciful, gracious, heavenly Father. And God understands that that doesn't happen overnight. If God had wanted puppets, we would have been made with strings. But we're not. We've been given this wonderful thing called, called free will. And as God sits and works with us through our lives, God's fondest hope is that we will come to a point in our life where we will fall to our knees and say, Lord, I choose you to be my God. I want a relationship with you more than anything else. I want to know you more than I want to eat. I want to love you more than I want to breathe. And so our job is to get ready. To get ready for the day when that God says he will come again. And he's keeping that day quiet. You know, it's fun to watch and see who likes to think they have the calendar just right. I sat next to a guy in an airplane. I mean, you know, you're in the back of a C-130 you, for four hours. You've got nothing to do. There's no in-flight movie. You got, you know, you're looking at the guy across from you hoping that uh, you're not drooling when you sleep like he's drooling when he's sleeping. But, you, you know, I was sitting next to a guy. We were, we were talking over the roar of the engines. And you talk like this. And uh, he was telling me all the, the, the sequence of events that's going to happen that he's discerned from Daniel and Revelation. And, and I kept coming back to him about every 20 minutes. I'd say, but you know what? Jesus says in Matthew that nobody knows except the Father. What do you say to that? Well, yeah, but it says here, here. And then, then he would correlate it again to current events. It was kind of fun after a while. Nobody knows when the Father's going to come. But you and I, we're supposed to be ready for that day. And so we're going to spend the next couple of weeks, we're going, to, we're going to talk about that. Today it's enough for you to know that it is your job to get ready. 
I wonder if Jesus were to come and were to just open the doors and were to pop in and say, hey, here I am, how many of you would actually really feel good about the fact that he was here? I have to say for me, I think, well, Lord, give me, give me, just give me 10 minutes. <laughs> but God says, no. Our job is to be ready. We are the ones who are left. We are the fortunate ones who are ready to wait and wait on our beloved God. And in that time of, of waiting, we're being transformed. You know, there is something about the image of the Creator that we bear. That's the, that's the image of God that we have. There is something about the image of Christ that is in us right now. But there's also something that's coming. For me, that thing that's coming is most likely, among other things, patience. I'm not a patient man. And I'm going to learn patience someday because that is going to be the image of Christ that comes to me. But it's not here yet. I'm waiting. God says, yep, that's your job. We wait and we make ready because our God is a God of his word. This is the most important thing to remember about Advent. That when he says your sins are forgiven, they're wiped clean. When he says there's a place for you in the kingdom, in the mansion of, of God's heavenly home, there's a place for you. And when he says he's coming again, you know he means it. So we're going to talk in the next couple of weeks. Next week we're going to talk about getting our house in order, how we get ready. Week after that we're going to talk about how we get our personal relationships in order. Once we have our house in order, then we, we work on our relationships. And then the third week we're going to talk about, or the last week of Advent, we're going to talk about once we've got our, our relationships in line and our houses in order, we are actually meant to go out and to build the kingdom and to look for God. But today, what I want you to do is to sit with me and remind each of us, be aware that we're meant to wait. So we're going to take a moment of silence. It's going to be hard to do, but we're going to wait. Let's wait. Father, in a noisy world that moves faster and faster all the time, it is more difficult every day to sit and not be moving, not be thinking, not be acting toward a goal. But Father, you say that our job is to wait. Help us, Father, in this season of Advent to wait well. Whether that means that we sit quietly for some time each day, aware of the fact that you're coming again, or you have us wait in some other way that you will show us, Father, help us to do exactly that. For we are the fortunate ones. We've not been taken. But we are the ones who are allowed to wait on the coming of the promised Messiah. Come, Lord Jesus, we're waiting.